Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our back in our Father's Word, the book of Matthew. We're going to pick it up in chapter 27, about verse 10 here in a moment. I want you to call to memory the ninth verse that we covered in the last chapter. It said, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah, not written by Jeremiah, but spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value. That is extremely important. And again, Jeremiah, you won't find it in Jeremiah because he didn't write it, he spoke it. But Zechariah did speak it. Well, where, where did he speak it at? Well, um, let's pick it up if we may in, uh, in verse 12. And we read in verse 12, of the 11th chapter of the great book of Zechariah. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Verse 13, And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was praised at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. You see, the, the um, enemy, which at that time was head of the church, so to speak, it wasn't an accident that they bought the potter's field for that 30 pieces of silver. It was written and spoken by Jeremiah and written by Zechariah exactly what it was be. And that's not all that's said here what that 30 pieces of silver brings. You want to know the full value. Verse 14, and as we continue, and, and I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. This is where the houses were divided, the house of Israel and the house of, of uh, Judah. Verse 15, and the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. This is one that is a liar. This is a false messiah. It is a shepherd that will not care for the flock, but will deceive them. Verse 16, For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither seek, uh, shall seek the, um, the young ones, that's to say the starving ones, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. It's just starving. He doesn't care. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. In other words, Antichrist, the false messiah, he doesn't care that it destroys your soul, that you worship him. He simply wants you to worship him. You're about to find why 30 pieces of silver was given, okay? Verse 17, woe to the idle shepherd. That, that means the false shepherd, okay? That leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm, that's the sword of the Lord, and upon his right eye, his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. In other words, um, the blood of Christ, with these people crying, crucify him, in the background, selling him for 30 pieces of silver, or purchasing him for 30 pieces of silver and putting it to the potter, ultimately makes it fair for God to kill Satan, the false shepherd, because he brought about the murder of the true son. Time about, fair play. God always, for every negative, there is a positive. And there you find the reason for the full price, 30 pieces of silver, the potter's field that puts all broken bodies back together and uh, the destruction of the evil one. So it becomes very important that you know and understand 
why that was given. You might uh, know also that 30 pieces of silver was the price of a slave. You could buy one for that. Verse 10. And as we continue in chapter 27, the great book of Matthew, verse 10 reads, And gave them, that's to say those 30 pieces of silver, for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. It was directed again there in Zechariah chapter 11. Verse 11 reads, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Question. And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. Now, what did Jesus say now? I think now, listen carefully. He said, You're the one that said that. I didn't say it. In the first place, he wasn't king of just the tribe of Judah. You just learned from chapter 11 in Zechariah that God split in two Judah and the house of Israel. He was king of all Israel, okay? all 12 tribes, not just the tribe of Judah. And uh, so, but this is what Pontius Pilate would ask him. He said, you're the one that said that. So when he's trying to find guilt, what did he find? Nothing, not a. He didn't claim to be king of the Jews. Pilate's the one that said it on hearsay. Verse 12, And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing, didn't open his mouth. Again, that's prophecy being fulfilled. This is why it's so important that you recognize the Old Testament and the fact of how meaningful it is for you to have clearer understanding of the Word of God. Verse 13, And then Pilate, then said Pilate unto him, <coughs> Hearest thou, <coughs> excuse me, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? Don't, don't you understand? All these things they're saying against you and you're, you're not opening your mouth? And verse 14, And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. He just couldn't understand that. <clears throat> Why would Christ not open his mouth? He's fulfilling prophecy. Bringing prophecy to pass right before your very eyes. And where do you find that? You find it in Isaiah chapter 53. I'm going to pick it up with verse 4. Listen carefully to what's transpiring here in the very eyes of Pilate and the crowd that's trying to hang him. Verse 4 reads, Concerning the Messiah that would come and he would lack nothing as far as beauty is concerned. Verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. They, he was innocent, and they delivered him up. Verse 5, But he was wounded. He would soon be pierced for our transgressions, not his. He didn't have any. He was bruised for our iniquities, our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. And so it is when you pray for a healing. His body took the stripes and you get the healing. How, how precious it is and how could you help but love a Savior like that that would stand in your place and on repentance simply forgive you and erase it from the book of life whereby you could attain eternal life. Verse 6, And we like sheep have gone astray. They scattered. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid, up on, uh, laid on him the iniquity of us all. All those sins, he carried them. He could handle it. He was perfect. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. There you go, fulfilling the scripture. Open not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Fulfilling that prophecy, and what was he? He was the lamb, the Passover lamb for that year. 
He was the lamb slain, the Passover lamb. That uh, Passover could be met that year. Well, what does that mean exactly? So that if you love him, if you repent, and if you're in him, the death angel must always pass over your house. That is to say, Satan himself. He cannot interfere with your home or your happiness. Um, he must pass over. Who made that available? Christ did through this crucifixion and through his standing in our way. And then as it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, he became our Passover. He became our Passover lamb that Satan must in Christ's name pass over your home. If you have the faith to believe and to exercise with authority in Christ's name, that order. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? You will. For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people was he stricken. He had no sins, but for the children. Verse 9, And he made his grave with the wicked. There was two malefactors hung on each side of him. That wasn't an accident. And with the rich in his death, his uncle Joseph of Arimathea was a rich tin man and, and had a brand new hewn tomb. And he was buried in that with the rich, because his uncle was rich. Because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He deserved it. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's Emmanuel, God with us, God himself taking the bruising. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall uh, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Christianity grows. It grows. I don't care what people might tell you in the media that churches are failing. They're growing. Those that truly teach the word, those that truly feed the sheep, you can't, uh, the pastors can hardly take care of the flock. There are so many. As it grows, it prospers. Verse 11, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. By what now? By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall hear, he shall bear their iniquities. He's going to bear it. He's going to take care of it. His knowledge and that knowledge being shared with you whereby you repent and come to the knowledge of the word, you're free. And that freedom cost an awesome price, but he didn't complain. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't say, let's put this off till tomorrow. He didn't open his mouth. He did it for you, 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He does even to this day. He makes that intercession for you when you repent. It's so very real. That's why Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality. It, it, is, it is a truth. And this is why when you teach your children the real truth, the chronological order of events of the end times, why Christ paid this price to destroy Satan who's coming as the false messiah. When you teach your children that there is no one will ever pull them away from that truth. I don't care what it goes through, nothing can separate one from that truth to know exactly what's going down. And that's why they're called God's election because they will make that stand. They have a purpose, they have a destiny. So, you see, he didn't open his mouth because he was documenting the Old Testament, the destruction of the false Messiah, and the blessings of those that would partake of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he paid that price for you. Returning then to chapter 27, the great book of Matthew, let's have the next verse, please, verse 15. Now, at that feast, this would be Passover, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. In other words, 
the Roman governor, he didn't care about religion, okay, number one. Uh, but he, it was his duty to keep the peace in the area. And to keep that peace, he would always release a prisoner to the, the people at their request to, to help calm nerves and keep peace. And that was, that was the customary. So what does he do? Verse 16. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. And notable, I guess, he was a murderer, big time. And what does Barabbas mean being translated? It means son of the father. So I want you to see how perfect our father is. Here we have Yeshua, which is Yahweh's Savior, the son of God. And here you have Barabbas, which is son of the father. Only it's the evil father. The very son of the devil himself, you might say. Which do you want released? The son of the living God or the son of the devil? Barabbas, it's your choice. How many murders had he committed? Many. Verse 17, I'm mean, just like his father Cain out the, coming out the gate. Verse 17, therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas? Or Jesus, which is called Christ. Now, there's where he probably messed up when he called him Christ. That's to say the anointed one. Christos, the anointed one. Because that would infuriate them. And, uh, but so it was. He didn't know. Verse 18. For he knew. This is Pilate. For he knew that for envy. That's to say jealousy. They had delivered him. He knew they were jealous of him. He had, he had taken a cat of nine tails, went into their synagogue and drove out the money changers and the mite infested doves, released them and, and had cleaned house. He had performed miracles and healing. They couldn't do that. And the people were following him by droves wherever he went. Even if it was out in the field, they followed him, emptied out the church house. They had to do something, they said to themselves. They couldn't cut it, but they still had the authority there, and God's scripture had to be fulfilled as it's written. And you must learn your lesson today, that there are many still in control that um, you must be aware of. You must know, because as God's elect, you have a duty, you have a destiny, a purpose, 19. When he was set down, um, and he knew that it was envy, of course, jealousy, and when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Now, uh, I suppose you could learn a lesson from this. God can use whomever he chooses to. I mean, this was a Roman uh, Pilate's wife. And God saw that she had a visitor. And she was made, it was made very clear to her that Christ was innocent. So she sends to her husband and says, you, you have nothing to do with this. This will cause Pilate at least three times to try to change minds even using psychology, and I'll point it out as we go along here. Verse 20, But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Uh, understand what is said there now when Jesus is used instead of uh, Christ. Uh, that is Yahweh's Savior. They choose to have the murderer because they're, they're children of the murderer, the first one. Christ would say this in St. John chapter 8, verse 44, you are of your father the devil, the first murderer from the beginning. And of course, a lot of, well, I've never heard a church teach that. Well, you've never heard them teach God's word, have you? Because that's where it's written and you can read it for yourself. St. John chapter 8, verse 44. 
They wanted him dead. And what had he done to deserve it? Nothing other than successful he was. You know, crooks can't stand somebody that's successful because they have the blessings of God upon them. And with God's blessings, you have success. Without it, you've got failure after failure after failure. So they chose the failure. Verse 21, the governor answered and said unto them, whether of the Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Verse 22. And Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is the Christ? And boy, he's giving him Yahweh's Savior, the anointed one. They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. What kind of religious community do you have here? You know, you're supposed to have two witnesses according to God's law before you can put someone to death, practice a, a capital punishment, which is biblical. They had no witnesses. They had no truth. They had nothing. He was not even opening his mouth defending himself. But even Pilate, by the touch of God upon his own wife, knew this man, he said, he hasn't done anything. Verse 23, and the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? He hadn't done any. But they cried out the more saying, let him be crucified. You see, there's no mercy among thieves. There's no mercy among liars, false prophets, and false religions. Satan is the liar and the father of it. And certainly it comes forth in a big way. And, and so it is that uh, God's word in this very trial, the, the doing in of an innocent one, but all according to God's plan so that you today could have forgiveness of sin. What he went through, I hope, makes you love him all the more. Because however you go at it, with all the good deeds he had done, the healings, raising of the dead, and to have people call it wanting him to die, to crucify him, to treat him like a criminal, when he had done nothing but that that was right. Yet at the same time, he knew Scripture had to be fulfilled. Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could not, he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made. I mean, there's trouble brewing. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. In other words, he didn't want trouble. It was his responsibility. He didn't want trouble with Caesar. Didn't want Caesar coming down on him to having this mob turn loose and cause all kinds of trouble. But he did wash his hands. He will still try, he will still be using psychology here if you're sharp enough to catch it, uh, to try to intimidate them just a little bit. But he wanted it made real clear, but he wanted this statement made that follows. Listen to it carefully. 25, what did they say when he said, I wash my hands of it, this innocent man, and called him innocent? 25, they answered, then answered all the people, not part of them, all of them, and said, his blood be on us and on and our children. And so it is that Matthew chapter 23 could come to pass that all from the generation of the offspring of the serpent, that's to say the Kenites, that on them would fall all the righteous blood from Zacharias um, all, uh, at the altar all the way back to Abel in the garden, done by Cain and his offspring, the offspring of the serpents. Uh, 
And, and here, that blood is still on their hand. They don't care. Don't care at all. Let it be on us and on our children forevermore, and certainly it will be. Verse 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. I, I feel that he scourged him hoping, this was psychology, hoping that by beating him and mauling him, they would finally have heart and say stop and and uh, let's, let's belay the crucifixion. It didn't work. But I truly feel that Pontius Pilate, though knowing he was innocent, thought, well, if we rough him up a little bit, maybe that'll pacify this bunch of people. It didn't work. 27, and then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered into him the whole of the band of soldiers, gathered him in there. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. This was royalty. They're, they're mocking him now. I still feel it's to rouse the crowd. 29, and when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, a staff, you know. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And again, King of only one tribe, not the whole house of Israel. And, and so it is that they mock him and continue on. Um, what, what he went through for us so that we could destroy the devil and those that choose to follow him. That's what it comes down to, and that's what it, what it will entail. Verse 30, And they spit upon him, and took the reed, and smote him on the head. And what, what, a, what a hateful act. Verse 31, And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him, and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. And so it is. And, you know, there is, there is so much written that, uh, concerning this very act as, as they led him up that hill. Well, let's go one more verse, 32. And as they came out, they found a man of Sirene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. I mean, after all the beating and everything, he, he had been weakened. But even in that beaten and weakened state, when you read in the Luke chapter 23, the women were along that trail going up to Golgotha, which means the skull, or Calvary, whatever language you wish to say it in. Looked like a skull, the hill. As he was going up, the women along the path were crying, weeping. And Jesus in, in, um, in Luke 23, verse 28, gave a beautiful message for you, his elect. He said to those women, Daughters, weep not for me, but rather weep for yourselves. For the day will come when it will be said, Blessed are those that are barren, meaning those that are not taken in by that false shepherd that have not conceived spiritually the lies and, and um, misfortune that he would bring upon some innocent people unlearned, not having that knowledge of Christ that we read of, but being unarmed and unwarned, they think he is the true Christ and probably would worship him. But here he continues on then, blessed are those that are barren, meaning that stand staunch, waiting for the second advent, the true return of Christ. And, and then he, meaning blessed are my bar the barren, meaning those that remain without child, spiritually speaking, and wait for the true wedding with the true Messiah. And then he made a closing statement 
on that march up to Golgotha. He said, if they will do this to the green tree, and he called himself a tree, meaning when the blood is flowing through these veins, if they would do it to me this way, think what they will do to the dry, meaning what do you think they will do to the Holy Spirit at the second advent, when the false, just before the second advent, when the false shepherd comes and, um, and he has God's own elect delivered up before him. That's, that's, that, but then we have nothing to worry about. Why? Because God gives us power over all that deception, all those lies. Christ always remembered us, even at these critical times. That's why he gave that message. Even as he's on his way up to be nailed to that cross, he said that little statement concerning his election. Blessed are the barren. Blessed are you. If you're one of God's elect and see the truth, know the truth and have the truth and hold the truth. Verse 33 to continue. And when they came upon a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull. Why? Because it looks like a skull. It's Calvary, Golgotha, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Verse 34, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Naturally, the Roman soldiers had, uh, it wasn't actually vinegar, it was a poor man's wine. And um, you, have, you have this um, written in Psalm 69 and... Um, about 21, and I'm going to read it to you. You won't have it. They gave me as gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap, and it shall be for the Antichrist. Okay. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. And that's when the wrath of God will begin to come down soon after. You know, these things will all... Um, vengeance belongeth to Almighty God. And all these things, even the sponge with the poor man's wine vinegar upon it, it was prophecy to strengthen you into knowing every word of God's word is profitable as knowledge, of especially of these end times. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We will not judge people. We have a judge. It's our Father. And he, does not, he doesn't appreciate your help in doing judgment. But you do have the right for spiritual discernment to know whether you're hearing truth or fiction. That's a gift from God, and 
and a precious gift to boot. It surely is. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you a mailing address. Uh, and uh, again, always a pleasure. You got a prayer request? You don't need that number. You don't need an address. Why? Well, God knows what you're thinking right now. He's, he's a cardio knower. He knows your heart, your mind. He knows what you're thinking. You don't have to pray out loud. He hears your prayer. And when you have need, he knows what you have need of before you even ask. Main thing he wants from you is your love. So let him know you love him. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct. Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. Pastor Murray, this is... Um, my, my name is Harley, and I am seven years old, and I want to know how God made people. Well, let, let's, let's answer first, why did he make people? <clears throat> he, you can find in the last verse of the fourth chapter of the great book of Revelation, he created all things for his pleasure. He, he create, because he loves, he doesn't want to be lonely, he loves, he loves his children. So he created them because he has um, the knowledge and the wisdom to put all the stars in heaven and put things as they are even though man can upset it. But he creates man in the image of the first person, spiritual people in the first earth age. They're an exact copy. That's why he would say in Genesis 1, let us create or form man in our image, meaning like we look. And, and so he did. He had a perfect pattern there, even from the first go-round. Wayne from Iowa. Um, it is obvious that God has blessed you greatly. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. I've heard you say that God says send murderers to him. It sounds like that is an automatic thing. But doesn't God forgive all who come to him and ask for uh, saving grace, um, as it was written in John 3.16? Well, no, the, you still have the law. Christ would say in the great book of Matthew, as we covered earlier, I don't change one jot of the law, not one tittle. And as you have read, those that kill which the word is fonyance in the Greek, and it means criminal homicide or in danger of perishing. In other words, I mean pronounced to hell. Um, so um, you, you always have to take in, our Father loves his children, and if you take one of them's life that's in good standing, you're kind of in a heap of, without a reason, okay? No crime of passion, that falls in a different category. And um, I, I don't want to go into scriptural law, but um, there are many different, but to lie in wait with nothing but pure evilness. No, God wants to give you a trial and then he'll decide whether he's going to forgive you or not. And, and the person that you murdered would be there waiting too to talk it over with you. A lot going on. No, no trial on earth solves what's going to happen in the judgment and the trial of Almighty God. Uh, James from, um, I think that's oh, Ohio, I'm not sure. When a Christian dies, how does your soul and spirit go to paradise? God bless you and your staff. Well, you're so welcome. Well, it, it, you step instantly into the spiritual body, which goes into a different dimension, and it returns to the Father from which it came. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, okay? It's, it's uh, many times I believe our Father sends a loved one prior or someone you trust to help with that journey. It does happen. Sarah from Pennsylvania. If the atheists don't believe in Christ, what will they think when Satan pretends to be Christ? Or do they believe he is Satan and, or no? And uh, thank you for your fa um, prayers. Um, there, it's going to be very difficult 
as it is written in Revelation chapter 13, beginning with verse 11, the miracles that Antichrist will be performing in the sight of people, snapping his fingers and lightning come down from heaven. That's going to make believers out of uh, a lot of people that have no faith and have no religion, nothing to believe on. They certainly don't have the truth from God's Word about what's really happening. So they're going to be impressed mightily. And so probably the atheist will worship the Antichrist when he comes. Uh, and uh, I would say it's a perfect setup for them. Uh, Diane from Ohio, question for television. The other day you said people who plan to have children should get married and seemed you were not saying it is adultery if they and others do not marry. I, no, you, you, missed, you, missed, you didn't listen good. We have people that want a civil marriage and a religious marriage. You, they should be married, okay? But if you're going to have children, you should have a civil service whereby you make it official by going to a county or wherever and perform getting a marriage license. Why? Because with children, that way they have the insurance of Social Security as our government uh, has set forth those particular things. If you were to take, if you were to a young lady and you decided you wanted just a religious ceremony, no civil, and you became pregnant and your husband died, you couldn't draw on his Social Security, okay? Because technically, civilly, you would not have been married. So it, uh, I know some states recognize common law, but you, you didn't listen to everything I said, okay? Kathleen from Georgia. Um, please add me back. Okay, we could do that. I, I would also like to ask a question. Presently, the only church that I attend is yours. I have three small children, and I would like to know how can I help them learn whom God is. I try to read scripture to them every night. We are now in the book of Psalms, and I do pray with them. Is there, is there more that I should be doing? If you teach them the truth concerning the chronological order of events, especially like in Mark 13, what God expects of his elect to stand against the false Messiah, there is nothing will ever take those children away from that. You know, um, you, you have a lot of people that are not real happy about what we teach. And I had one of these so-called uh, experts uh, would say, once Shepherd's Chapel teaches a person, your chances of getting them back are very slim. Uh, well, naturally, you're, no one's going to leave the truth once they have it. Okay. Uh, there's the, everything we do is televised. Everything we teach is taught on live television, whereby nothing is hidden, and yet some people, if it goes against their particular denomination, they think you pull their, we don't ask anybody to join our church, leave theirs, we don't talk against any church, but certainly some of them talk against us. But that's their problem. We, we have no problem with it. But. Once you teach a child the real truth, the chronological order of events and their destiny, nobody, nobody is ever going to change their mind or take that away from them. The truth is permanent. Uh, Loxer from Ohio. Pastor, are we in God's thoughts when we die? Well, more so than that, we are with him. He, we, we instantly return to him. Do we go back to the Father who we are good, whether we're good or bad, or just if we are in his thought? The good, bad, and the ugly, they all go there. Why? Because he's the judge. you got to stand trial before him. And uh, that's what you go back to him for. Naturally, we have the millennium period that you have to take into consideration. But um, even the bad go back to where God is. They're on the wrong side of paradise, but they're there. Uh, Luke chapter 16 will explain that for you. Gail from Virginia. You're welcome. Thank you for the comment. 
Question, will we be in flesh bodies when the two witnesses appear? And will we see them um, on television as a world news event? Probably so. I mean, they'll come to the attention of the, the two, no doubt. But we will know them also. They will lead God's elect, basically. And, um, and uh, th those will be pri uh, precious times. And we all look forward to that. That's fine. David from North Carolina. Uh, question. M my mom sent me some books called Through the Bible with J. Vernon McGee. I find his commentaries interesting and seems to have similar beliefs as you teach. What do you think of his teaching? I thought I heard you say you went to Bible college with him and you knew him. Both my mom and I would like to know. Thank you. No, I, I knew him personally, but it was my wife, Anna, whom I have lost, but uh, it was she that went attended uh, his college and I had the privilege of meeting him. I was in the Marine Corps at that time. And he made a trip one time here to Gravit, Arkansas. And I was able to speak with him again. He, he taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Um, he certainly had some thoughts that, um, that would be different than, than I teach. But basically, anytime you teach the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you're going to be successful. And certainly J. Vernon McGee was a student of God's Word. And uh, certainly he did teach chapter by chapter, and he was a good shepherd. I have, I have nothing but uh, respect for him. Charles from California. When various religious groups knock on your door, is it wrong to let them in and talk with uh, even though you don't agree with them? You know, uh, we never at Shepherd's Chapel interfere with what somebody feels led to do uh, from our Heavenly Father. We believe what we teach. Our Father's in charge and He gives you the unction of whether you should or shouldn't. So that's something that you totally have to make your own mind up about. And um, what, what would you take into consideration? Well, if you had young ones in your home that you feel they might mislead, then you might take that into consideration. But I, I still hold that when you teach your children the truth, there's nobody. Nobody's going to change their mind and or their thinking. The truth is precious. Charles from California. I raised my only son alone. He became diabetic at the age of six and he died at age 30. I have loved him more than anything and it concerns me that I may love him more than God. Is this feeling normal or am I wrong? Well, a parent's feeling is strong and that's why God's love for you is so strong. You're his child. But it is written in Luke chapter 14 that you must, the word is hate, but it means love less. So don't, don't get carried away with it. You can't hate your own family, but you should love your own family less than God. Why? Because he died for you. And, uh, you're, you will see your son in, in the millennium, and uh, but also you will see the Lord Jesus Christ, you will see the Father. Dennis from Wisconsin. What does the end of Revelation chapter 3 mean when he takes John to show him what's going to happen? Well, if, if, I, if I may, it's not chapter 3, the end of it, it's the beginning of chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. He, the first three chapters, basically the first introduction, two and three to the seven churches. And um, after the seven churches, then he takes John up to the Lord's Day, which means the first day of the millennium, up to heaven, to show him what happens just before and after. Um, the, the time sequence, you can only arrive at one place. And that's in chapter 1, verse 10. It states very clearly that John was taken to the Lord's day. It didn't mean a Sabbath. It meant the Lord's day, the first day of the millennium. 
and he was showing what happens then, before, and after, so that he could write the book of Revelation, where that when you properly and wisely rightly divide the word, you have an understanding of what befalls us in this end generation, the generation of the fig tree. Linda from Oklahoma. What denomination is Shepherd's Chapel? We are non-denominational. A denomination divides, okay? We, we are Bible teachers. There's only one Word of God, and uh, all people must gain from that Word, the Word of God. Charles from California. What is the name of God? Our Heavenly Father uh, was asked by Moses, what, what you, how, who am I going to say sent me? Who am I going to say you are? And he said, you tell them that I am that I am. And from that comes, the, that is the etymology of the sacred name. And from that comes the four consonants. And the four consonants make, uh, which w is impossible for the tongue to, to express. But when you put the vowel, then you have Yahweh, which the, in language makes it read our, um, Yahweh being uh, our Heavenly Father. And certainly, what is he? He is whatever he wishes to be. I am that I am. And he's your father. He's your protector. And then, on, if you want to go really into the Hebrew, you have various names past that. You have Yahweh Jovri, which is to say, the, our Heavenly Father that provides when you're praying for something to facilitate the church. You, you would pray... A scholar would pray to Yahweh Jaguri. Okay, so th that would be his the father's name that provides. John, Johnny from Joni, rather from Nevada. Do I understand that you said when someone is a victim of a murder, that they will stand with the murderer in front of God for judgment? What, 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 naturally, when God has a trial who better to have there than the person that's deceased, okay? They're with the Father. Um, the, and, and Father knows the thoughts of people. That's why he can judge. We can't. We don't know what is in the mind of people um, and um, what, what brings people to act. This is why you want to be very careful when you set yourself up as judge because you have crimes of passion, that's not lying in wait with the evilness. That means somebody has wronged you and hurt you to the point that you're practically out of your mind. Can't live with it. That falls under a different category. So I always must be very careful because you can never judge a thing until you totally, completely hear both sides <clears throat> and then, that's the way God judges. <clears throat> but it's only, excuse me, it's only common sense that when your trial is held in heaven, naturally, the victim's going to be there. The, uh, the, I mean, the goods are there. It's, you don't have to wonder, well, can I prove this or prove that? Uh, the voice is going to be there of what actually happened and so forth. Georgia from, Georgie from Georgia. If we have asked God to forgive our sins, past and present, then why should we be judged in heaven? Well, what about all the good things you've done? You, you, judgment gives you a reward for those. And you certainly want your payday, don't you? You know, I, it is a common thing that Christians like to get themselves on guilt trips. And when you mention the word judgment, they can only look at it in one way, that it's something bad. No, it's something beautiful. It's something good. It's, it's when we collect what we have coming to us. And naturally, if you've got a lot of sin, you got a lot of coming to you that's not going to be too pretty. But if you've got a lot of good works, then you've got a lot of good things coming to you that's beautiful, serving God. Judgment is that you get what you got coming to you. Demetrius from North Carolina. Is there a place in the Bible that describes what heaven is like? Well, heaven is wherever God is. 
And I think that uh, there is more than one place that describes heaven. I, I like to probably best describe it in Revelation chapter 21, when all is said and done and God rejuvenates this world. It's going to be his home. We're not, the heaven's going to be right here on earth. God made an eternal covenant with the city of Raius, Jerusalem. And uh, that's where his, he will set his kingdom, his palace, his heaven. And, uh, and, but the earth will be rejuvenated, put back in its original form, where there is no winter or summer and everything is just uh, good all year round. And uh, what a beautiful place. No sin, no, um, nothing that offends, just a beautiful place. Uh, Preston from Arkansas. I'm 18 years old and I thank God for you and your pro. Thank you. You're welcome. I've been watching for over a year and I believe I'm one of God's elect and I'm a watchman. So I watch uh, my um, lifetime. Have I been, have I seen many earthquakes and killings? And those are simply times of the millennium, but uh, you get your main thing from Say like Mark 13, and that old millennium's coming, but unfortunately I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes His day. When you read the letter He has sent to you with understanding. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and listen good. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word, even with trouble, it's still a good day. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.